The reading clerk will now call the roll. Bibbs. It's money and power that control this town. Bishop of North Carolina. All we're talking about chaos and dysfunction in Washington because Republicans didn't sit down like Democrats do. Crane. It's like this cul-de-sac of greed and corruption and it just keeps going around and around. Gates. I felt like it doesn't even matter which party wins the majority because both sides are working for the same lobbyists. Luna. I had a reporter that basically accosted me in the hallway saying really vile stuff. Perry. One member came up to me and said, your presence disgusts me. Roy. So maybe the American people need to know the truth. And it's extraordinary what happens when you tell the truth in this town. People go, what the hell are you doing? Like, why would you do that? The fact is, well, we won because we were telling the truth. Well, I think what we are fighting for was um, change. Everybody knows this town is broken. When people talk about the swamp or the establishment, I think another word I like better is the cartel, the uniparty cartel. I think of various aspects, bureaucracy, the lobbyists, this media cartel, all of these have produced interlocking relationships, which is why I call it a cartel. And it doesn't matter who's in power. Washington's a fundamentally corrupt place. Far too often, the way that people get leadership positions or committee assignments or even have their legislation considered is all based on money. This establishment, this swamp, is designed to protect itself. The most corrupt time in this place is freshman orientation. Because during freshman orientation, you get the best steak you've ever eaten, the finest wine you've ever had, and they literally sit you down at tables with the lobbyists who lobby the committees that they know you want to serve on. And from day one, before you're even sworn in, they're convincing you that your path to prosperity in this town runs through the corrupt redistribution of special interest funds. It has been abundantly clear for a long time that only a handful of people decide what bills get to the floor, how they get to the floor, what the rules are and how they are debated on the floor, whether members can amend on the floor. When I came up here, really one of the first things that I realized and it was shocking to me that I couldn't just as a representative bring a bill to the floor, that it had to go through something called the Rules Committee. And there were certain members that were a part of that Rules Committee, but it was a very small fraction. And that if they didn't like your legislation or your proposed legislation, that that wouldn't be brought to the House floor. I remember when I, I first came to Congress and I wanted to serve on the Armed Services Committee because my district has such a high concentration of active duty military and I was told by a member of our leadership that if I wanted to serve on that committee that I need to furnish $75,000 in the next 10 days to the political fund for Republicans in the House of Representatives. And at first I was like, is anybody here wearing a wire? It struck me as a shakedown, but I learned that that happens every day. Because we didn't get the red wave that everybody thought we were gonna get, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise, conservatives actually had a chance to push this bar party back towards you know, its conservative roots. The whole debate about the speaker was important on a host of different levels. First of all, you gotta go back to why it even happened. All the way back to last summer, before we knew what the majority breakdown was gonna be, was it gonna be a five seat majority, a 20 seat majority, a whatever. And we said, look, this is an opportunity to change the culture, change, change the way things were done in Washington, D.C. We were all sitting down saying, what do we need to change about this place in terms of how the rules work, both in the Republican conference and the House rules? To take away some of the power and authority that has been over the last couple of years isolated more towards the top at leadership and, and push that back down towards the members, which in turn pushes that back towards their voters or their constituents. So I went to leadership. We started out with a simple set of rules. We wrote them up and said, here are the problem with our current rules. We want to talk about some spending, talk about committee assignments, not for us personally, but just to have a, a look across the conference and make sure all voices were heard. We were completely dismissed. That morning on the 3rd, we had a conference. There was a lot of um, discord in the room, and one of the gentlemen, high-ranking official in the Congress, 
person with a lot of levers of power goes to the microphone and tells everybody, if you don't vote a certain way, you're going to be removed of all your committees. It'd be nice to wipe from the history books. It was, a, it was extraordinarily uh, hostile, and that uh, fried a lot of feelings. It left people in not exactly a state of mind uh, to resolve anything. When we started going through the process and we were putting another name out for consideration for speaker, and the first number was 19, we had three votes at 19, and then it went to 20. We realized in the middle of that that we suddenly had a, an opportunity to speak to the entire House of Representatives, all 435 of us. Right now, Kevin McCarthy does not have the votes. He just made history not in a good way as being the first in 100 years, the first man to uh, lose the speakership in the first round. The House stands adjourned until noon tomorrow. Now, within the conference, sure, there were some hard feelings. People didn't like the process. I was contacted by a female member of Congress, and she basically said that me and the other members that voted against Leader McCarthy would be made examples of. I mean, it was a pretty wild phone call. Here's what's interesting. The court of public opinion, the conservative apparatus in Washington, right? All the smart ones, all the blue check mark Republicans. These guys are, you know, uh, risking the House Speaker. They're gonna turn the speakership over to the Democrats. My phone was blowing up by a whole lot of supporters, but a pretty good vocal minority of detractors. Chip, what are you doing? You guys are, you look crazy. You're gonna ruin it for Republicans. We're not gonna choose a speaker. We look disorganized. I had um, big donors call me up yelling and screaming saying, this is a clown show. And I'm like, how is it a clown show? People standing up, offering debates and going back and forth. That's not a clown show. That's the way a constitutional republic works. We are getting hit from the left, from the right. I mean, people that we thought were our allies in conservative media were calling us extortionists. They were saying that we were terrorists. They were using the media to pressure our constituents into thinking that we were somehow single-handedly by debating ideas in Congress, we were somehow destroying the country. Well, let's face it, the media coverage always revels in any discord or perceived discord whatsoever in the Republican conference. So the vast majority of the media Media is left-leaning and supportive of the left, if not just running the ball for them in every occasion. And it took a, took a while before everybody knew we were serious, but they finally got it. And we were willing to go to the table, we always were. And it's kind of funny, when people realize you're serious, then they take you seriously. Suddenly everybody was saying, wait, these guys and gals are fighting for something. Some of my best friends in conservative media were sharply criticizing me by name frequently as soon as they saw the result they couldn't wait to pick up the pom-poms and start waving them there was one point we're in the middle of this heated debate it's first thing in the morning it was like seven o'clock eight o'clock in the morning representative massey who was voting for speaker mccarthy runs in out of breath cars in the middle of the street he's like if you guys can pull this off you will be able to bring the institutional change that i've been trying to get for like the last like 12 years that's all he said then he left i think it was about what the 13th vote or something like that we were in negotiations uh the day previously late into the evening and even into the next morning and we had felt relatively comfortable that we had a framework so that last day friday we were furiously working right before we went back on the floor that evening we you know, met with the speaker with uh, the definitive agreement and he he indicated his agreement to it. So that's the time you saw kind of the dam break and there was a large number of members that were previously not voting for Speaker McCarthy that suddenly said, I will, and if you remember when I stood up, I said, in good faith, Kevin McCarthy. Therefore, the Honorable Kevin McCarthy of the state of California, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> And now, the hard work begins. We will hold the swamp accountable. From the withdrawal of Afghanistan, to the origins of COVID, and to the weaponization of the FBI. The most important thing we got out of this was fundamentally changing the balance of power. First time ever in Congress, a single subject rule. So bills that come through have a single subject. If they don't, we don't take them up or we divide them. Key provisions like a 72 hours to be able to read bills, the ability to offer amendments that are germane, you know, they're relevant to the actual underlying uh, text of the bill. To stop spending money we don't have. We never wanted to legislate by omnibus 
ever again. The diversification of members that are conservative on very important committees to include oversight and judiciary and house rules and appropriations. We're going to have a strong weaponization committee attached to the judiciary to go after the woke weaponized government disrupting our freedom. The power to ensure the speaker honors his commitments by making sure we maintain the ability to vacate if we have to use it, which you never really want to do. Those are all things that people said, wait a minute, they're fighting for us. The reason that I did what I did and voted the way I did for 14 or 15 rounds was because that's what I heard from my voters for a year and a half. If you go out, walk out of my office and look on the sign on the door, it says representative. My job is to represent what they want. They hired me to come to Washington to fight to change the town for them. But how do you go out and negotiate if you don't have some people willing to say, hmm, you can't just count on my vote.